Good morning, church. It's so great that we all can be together. Psalm 90 is a prayer of Moses. In this prayer, Moses acknowledges God as being a God of justice, of wrath, but God is also merciful. In this prayer to God, Moses writes in verse 14, Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. So let's remember God's unfailing love as we sing. Oh, worship the King, our glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, a million in splendor and with praise. Oh, tell of His God, oh, sing. Another God created by human hands, you and I are God dependent on any part of man, you and I are God in the end, anything we can do by your hand is just the way. This morning, we are going to be taking a look at Exodus chapter 7 to 10. What's plaguing you? 
I don't know if you've watched enough television to see these really popular My Pillow commercials. Uh, they're everywhere. It's quite ubiquitous. Uh, but it's interesting because the founder of that My Pillow commercial uh, or pillow was uh, Mike Lindell was a former crack addict. He was uh, so addicted that even his own crack dealers would not sell to him after he had been awake for 14 days straight. Three of them formed an intervention, told other crack dealers not to sell to him. And, and actually, that was a, God had to bring him to a very low point in his life where uh, he would struggle with drugs. He would go through a divorce in his life. And, and, and all these low points would grab his attention. And it's interesting because during that intervention with three of its crack dealers who were doing an intervention, one of them took a photograph of him in his very sad state and says, you know what, you're going to need this picture for your book one day. You made a promise to you come back after you found Jesus or whatever, you would come back and help us all. And uh, so he said, okay, God, please bring to an end these addictions. I don't want to have that desire again. And then I'll do this platform thing you've got me on, he said. And when I wake up in the morning, when he woke up in the morning, he said the desire was gone. God removed that desire for crack cocaine and, uh, and he got right with Christ. God blessed his pillow business to a point where two of those three crack dealers that did that intervention for him now work for him in his in his corporation. And so uh, he credits the Lord Jesus Christ for having to use some very, very hard times to break his stubborn heart. How does God deal with somebody who is hard hearted, who with somebody who is stubborn? Maybe there was a time in your life where you've been stubborn with God and he has to use very hard times to get your attention. I know when there are people who walk away from the Lord, and we beg and plead for them to, to come back to Christ, and, and they don't. We pray that God will get their attention in different ways because God loves them. He also loves Pharaoh. He created Pharaoh. He placed Pharaoh on the throne. He gave Pharaoh 10 chances with these 10 plagues to repent and to get right. We also see that this Pharaoh, who I believe is Amon Hotep II, was a, he was a proud military king. Pharaohs were also considered gods. So he had a very elevated view of himself. And Yahweh, he says, who was this Yahweh? It says God hardened his heart. But what that means is that basically God removes any kind of restraining grace. God, God, God's grace keeps us from being worse off than we could be. And when Pharaoh was being hardened in his heart, he basically said, you know what? If you want to keep on being stubborn, I'll let you go on your own way. Pharaoh made his choice. God didn't make him rebel. He chose to rebel. And as we see in Romans 1, the hardened heart of Pharaoh is just being allowed to continue and being given over to their sin, as we see in the first chapter of Romans. So today, as we take a look at the 10 plagues, we are going to see how God is getting Pharaoh's attention. Maybe this will ring true for us on how God needs to get our attention to something that we are stubborn about. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will break stubborn hearts today that refuse to trust Christ. Father, we pray uh, for our loved ones and our friends who are stubborn towards God. And Father, I pray that like you would even give Pharaoh 10 chances. Oh, Father, that uh, the stubborn one would see your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to talk about these 10 plagues. But before we get to these 10 plagues, uh, there is a just a, a kind of a setup that's going on here uh, where, where we are learning that God is in full control and we can obey or fight. Now, remember the main players here. We have God who is Lord, we have Pharaoh as a human thinking he's Lord, and we have Moses who's been a two-time loser in Egypt. He had to flee Egypt when he was 40 after 
uh, he tried to be a deliverer for Israel, but failed. Then he had to go to the desert for another 40 years to learn how to depend on God. At 80 years old, he comes back to Egypt with this message from the burning bush to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And what happens is Pharaoh doesn't listen to him. And not only does Pharaoh not listen to him, Israel isn't listening to him too. So here we have this fragile Moses who's saying, why me? Why am I here? And uh, we have Pharaoh who says, well, not me. Who, do you, who does this Yahweh think he is? And then we have God who is Lord. And so what we see in verses 1 to 13 is basically that God says, hey, I'm giving you my authority. Speak to me, uh, speak to Pharaoh on behalf of me with your brother Aaron. Tell him to let my people go. We see Pharaoh's heart gets hardened because the grace is removed, the restraining grace is removed. But here is the key thing. He wants the Egyptians to know that God is Lord. That he wants everybody to know, I am Yahweh. I am the pre-existent, eternally existent, always existing God who never had a beginning, never has an end. And the world would obey this God, including Egypt. So here, Moses at 80, Aaron at 83 are being used by God in a very difficult uh, challenge. So they go before Pharaoh, and God says, take that rod that you carry with you that you've been using as a shepherd, throw it down, and it will turn into a snake. And so what happens during that time is that there's a, there's a couple of magicians. The term for this magicians also meant that they were part of the priest's court of Pharaoh. So they were not just David Copperfields and, uh, you know, and the uh, Penn and Tellers doing sleight of hand tricks. They were religious priests as well. And so they, in a sense, replicated uh, a stick turning into a snake. They had skills of sleight of hand, deceptive illusions. Um, even way back then, there were methods to tame a snake, a cobra, by by uh, rubbing the correct portion of the nape of its neck to make it stiff. And then if you just throw it, throw it down, it could turn into a moving stick. But a lot of commentators also believe that these guys were satanically empowered. But the ability of Janice and Jambres, we'll learn their name later, but Janice and Jambres, who are these magicians, were unable to match the, uh, the power of God, the scale of what God was doing, they were unable to reverse these 10 plagues that God was doing and only were able to replicate about three of the 10 things that they were able to do, including the snake and the first two of the miracles. So here, we, what we do see, though, that it's not about Pharaoh or the magicians. It's not even about Moses, who in the eyes of Egypt is a two-time failure. It is about God who in verse 5 says, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. They will know that I am God. So what we see in these uh, prelude passages before we get to the nine of the Ten Commandments, we're saving the tenth for next week, is that God is foreknowing. He's telling Moses and Aaron everything that's going to happen in advance, even to the point of Pharaoh's heart and heart. But because he knows and he everything that's going to happen, even what we are going to choose to do, we have to stand in awe of this all-knowing creator. We also see he's sovereign because there is no person who will not get off the throne. He is in absolute control, but he's also merciful. He could have killed Pharaoh years ago. He could have killed him even before the first plague, but he didn't. He's given Pharaoh 10 chances to repent. And 10 chances also demonstrates the patience of God. That's 10 more than Pharaoh deserved. So because God is foreknowing and sovereign, why do we continue to rebel? Because God is merciful. Are we trying to save ourselves through something outside of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross as the substitute for our sin and rose again? And because God is patient, we also must know that there's an end to this patience. 
where he must judge. And so we shouldn't take God lightly. This is all about God. So as we come to the 10 plagues, <clears throat> we will realize that God is just because he will judge sin, but he's also merciful. 10 plagues, 10 chances, 10 opportunities to repent. But it's also important to note that this is not about the people that he wants to judge, but the gods that they worship to be proven that they are ineffective. He's trying to get them from their idolatry and their dependence on Pharaoh and Pharaoh as a god, on the Nile as a god, as the air gods and the land gods. So they had water gods, they had land gods, and they had uh, sky gods. They had 80 major deities, and yet, as God would summarize in Exodus 20, verse 3, in the very first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. This is really what these 10 plagues are about, that there will be no other god. So out of these 80 gods that are worshipped, 80 major gods, I mean, because everything was made into a god for the Egyptians. Anything that moved was made into a god, but they had 80 major deities, three clusters, the Nile, the river, the land, and the sky. The first two plagues were aimed at the water gods, the next four, the land gods, and the last four of the 10 plagues were aimed at the sky god, including uh, the ability for God to go through the night uh, for the firstborn, and the sky gods are unable to stop him. So here, it's really aimed to show that these gods are nothing compared to the real God. I mean, they don't even exist. And so here we're going to take a look at the very first um, plague where the river turns to blood. Some of the key things that are being said here, Moses says, let my people go. He's telling the Pharaoh, so far you have not obeyed. And God is saying, you shall know that I am the Lord. So it's interesting. What does he go after first? The Nile River is the life of Egypt. Everything happens in Egypt. And then God says, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and their ponds. So it wasn't just the river. It's everything that tributed off this river all the pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there should be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. So what he's saying is even your storage pots of water will turn to blood. Even your, your pitcher that you have in your fridge of water will turn into blood. Right? So, so that's what he's saying. It's going to be that extensive. You know, for uh, for this river to be affected, as one commentator noted, he says, the Nile was the lifeblood of Egypt. Essentially, there's no Egypt without the Nile. It was responsible for transportation, irrigation, drinking water, food, and the setting of the calendar. They would set the calendar to the annual floods that would help the farmers with their crops. So, so this would be catastrophic. I mean, you think you think uh, COVID was devastating to our economy. This river being taken away is devastating to this nation. And so here was a challenge to, uh, this, ri to this river god of Hopi. Hopi is the bull god that's presented on the bottom picture here. And, uh, and this bull god was responsible for the annual flooding. There was another god goddess of the River Nile by the name of Isis. Isis would cry over her dead husband, Osiris, uh, and her tears would cause this flood in the belief of the Egyptians. And then there was also Kamun, who was a ram guard, who was the guardian of the Nile. These gods were powerless to stop what God was able to do. The magicians were able to replicate a portion of it, but not to the same scale as God, nor were they able to overturn it. The imagery is clear. Is Nile and their gods the life giver, or is Yahweh the giver of life? 
Is God the one who gives life through the blood? These deities could not stop because they don't exist. So then comes the second plague. And this is a land filled with frogs. Now, critics would say that this was actually red silt that came in from two other rivers into the Nile. And then there was some kind of algae with a special bacteria that, that would uh, uh, remove the oxygen out of the water and kill the fish. Well, that's pretty remarkable of that extended to the water tank in your house and the pitchers too, because that's not coming in uh, directly. You're not getting water uh, that's, that's red. So, but then these critics of the Bible and the miracles of God would also say that this forced the frogs onto the land. Well, the second plague here of frogs, we read verse three, the Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come upon into your house and into your bedroom and onto your bed and into the houses of your servants and your peoples and into the ovens and the kneading bowls. The frogs shall come upon you and on your people and on your servants. They would afflict Egypt, not Israel. But here these, these frogs were here and then they would die and they would stink. It's interesting that uh, on the top right corner, I have a picture of the frog goddess Heket. Uh, Heket was a frog goddess married to Kanun that we talked about as the river guardian who was, uh, who was a ram god. Uh, Heket would blow life into the clay human figures that her husband Kanun shaped on a potter's wheel. I mean, that's, that's how they think life begins. But their frog goddess couldn't even keep their frogs alive. They would die in mass, much less create humans because she doesn't exist. So here we see God is saying, I'm Yahweh. There, there are no other gods besides me. Well, Pharaoh's hard-hearted and needs a third method to be convinced. So what happens, uh, creatures are now covered with gnats. Now, we don't know if these, they're not like the, the little fruit flies that you have buzzing around your bananas. Uh, these could be lice or mosquitoes. One pastor says that the Hebrew word for gnats here talks about an insect that actually invades your nose and your ears and stings you. And so, uh, so this, was, uh, this, this was something that the magicians actually could not in any way try to reproduce. In fact, it is said in verse 19, this is the finger of God. So these gnats... If it, if it wasn't worse, I don't know if you've ever had fly infestations. They're not, they're not, they're not fun. But that's what happened next as Pharaoh hardened his heart. So Moses goes back to Pharaoh, let my people go. And if you don't, the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms and flies. But I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms or flies shall be there. So what we see here, just the Egyptians are afflicted. The Hebrew are protected. If you belong to God, God is going to protect. He wants to rescue us. He wants to save us from judgment. This is a, a beautiful picture, uh, even through these judgments, of the mercy that we have in Jesus Christ, of God not wanting any to perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so here we see that uh, there is uh, a deliverance for the Hebrew uh, people, and uh, the Egyptians were afflicted because their fly god or their beetle god of resurrection were unable to, uh, to stop uh, this attack and death by flies. The fifth plague is... Uh, you know what? It was either this or a dead cow. And I thought a dead cow would just freak people out. All right. But livestock was struck with death. And so the livestock of the Egyptians would uh, die. This would include cows, horses, donkeys, camels, and sheep. Even Hathor, the goddess with the cow head, and Apis, the bull god of fertility, could not stop God. The heart of Pharaoh was hardened, but not that of Israel's. So God tried to get Pharaoh's attention with the sixth plague, where skins were afflicted with boils. So it's said that Moses and Aaron uh, went and took handfuls of soot from the kiln, and they threw it up in the air. 
if you've watched enough basketball and you've seen LeBron ever since uh, his early days, he would go take some talcum powder or whatever they have on the side that dries their hands. And then he would throw it up in the air before the game. That's kind of similar to what Moses and Aaron uh, did uh, here. They would toss the ash. And then what would happen was immediately people got afflicted with a skin boil, these, these huge painful sores beginning with the magicians and then the rest of Egypt, where even Sekhmet, the goddess uh, with power over disease, or Sunu, the pestilence god, or Isis, the god of healing, could not stop the one true god. Why? Well, they don't exist. So here, uh, again, Pharaoh hardened his heart. So God sent hail, hail even with fire. Again, we see verse 26, only in the land of Goshen. Now, Goshen, remember, that's where Joseph settled with the, with the Hebrew people. And so when they settled in Goshen, this, uh, this, this beautiful, fertile land, they were not affected by the hail. Only, only the, the people of Egypt were. So what's interesting, after these huge, I mean, I don't know where you've been where you've seen huge hail, but these were cataclysmic. Uh, they had seen nothing like this before. So here we get to a point where, where uh, Nut, the sky goddess, Osiris, uh, the god of crops and fertility, and Set, the god of storms, could not stop this. So Pharaoh starts to say words of repentance. This time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. All right, so now we're starting to see a little change of words, but words are empty if they don't follow through with action. And so what happens is God does stop the hail, and then Pharaoh just changes his mind and goes back and hardens his heart. You know, uh, Moses even said to Pharaoh, but as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. There are a lot of people who will say words, but don't mean it in their heart, that they have turned from their sin. They believe in Jesus Christ as their savior. This false profession is very similar to the false professions that we see in churches today, where, where people know enough of the words to say, but they don't really, in their heart, know that they're a sinner deeply needing to trust Christ as their savior alone. So as Pharaoh's hearts were hardened, here we see the eighth uh, plague is crops destroyed by locusts. And so um, so after this got to Pharaoh, he was willing to let the men go. Moses said, no, hey, bud, that's not part of the deal. You let everybody go, women and children and livestock. Pharaoh refused, so the locusts swarmed, and uh, Pharaoh feigned a repentance again. The locusts stopped. And then after the locust stops, guess what? Pharaoh hardened his heart again. So we come to the ninth, to the ninth uh, plague. We're not going to get to the tenth. That's next week when we talk about Passover and the and the firstborn. But the ninth plague is that of the sky being blanketed with darkness. This is a darkness that it, it extended three days. It was pitch dark. And so it was so dark, you can't get anything done. I mean, they didn't have the incandescent bulb. You know, they, they, they needed the sun to be productive. There was no production for three days. Ray, the sun god, Nut, the sky goddess, and Hathor, the sky goddess, couldn't stop it. And Pharaoh, in, in just desperation, just told Moses, I don't want to see your face again. And Moses said, fine, you won't. <laughs> and so, so, uh, so this, th this is the, these are the 10 plagues that we see here. Well, nine of the 10 plagues, and we'll get to the 10th next week. So in conclusion, you know, as we think about, I mean, 10 plagues, God called it. He even knew the response. Uh, he was getting to a point of proving that there are no other gods before him. But because he knows it, and he's sovereign, and he demonstrates his absolute control. Why is it that we are still fighting him when it comes to the authority in our lives? Why are we acting like Pharaoh and think that we have something to prove over Pharaoh? Secondly, because God is merciful. Heed his warnings to place our faith in Christ. 
he's merciful and uh, uh, by by giving by by giving people opportunities and letting them live as long as they live when we deserve to die for our very first sin because sin is such an atrocious uh, affront to our sinless and holy God. But we should have died with our first sin. But the very fact that we get to live another day and that God wants to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness and giving us his righteousness. That's what he does when we put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. He forgives your sins and he takes away uh, he takes away the penalty of our sin. He put it on Christ. But Christ also took his righteousness and put it on in us. Would you place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior? They hoped for resurrection in the afterlife. Egypt did. But the real hope is in Jesus Christ, who does resurrect those who die and will be forever with God. I hope that you respond to God's mercy by placing, uh, by trusting Christ as your Savior. And the third point here is because God is patient. Know that there is an end point to his patience. Right? I mean, 10 plagues. What's it going to take to get our attention? Why are we so slow in responding? God is patient, but one day he will judge. Don't wait, because after this lifetime, there is no other chance. This lifetime is our chance of, of God's wonderful patience. So don't be like Pharaoh, stubborn, resisting the authority of God, the mercy of God, and the patience of God with 10 opportunities to repent. Turn your heart from your self-authority and your stubborn sin, and otherwise God is going to do some very harsh thing to get our attention. Respond to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you you love Pharaoh. Thank you that you even gave him 10 opportunities here to obey you and to do the right thing. Thank you that the nation had a chance to see your power and authority and that the nation ha had the chance. And we understand that there are some people in Egypt who would put their faith in God because of this. But uh, Father, we, we want to uh, pray for us that we will recognize our own stubborn streak when it comes to you. And we will relent to your lordship in our lives. We will also stop seeking any other religious way to save ourselves and put our faith in Jesus Christ alone, who is our Savior and our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Hi, church family. Um, good. Thank you, Pastor Steve, for sharing today's message. We praise the Lord for his patience upon us, his mercy, his grace, and uh, we, we, we are so grateful to be part of, of his family. By, by his mercy to us. Um, let me call your attention to a few of our announcements today. Um, I hope you are enjoying the Zoom worship. Uh, it allows us to just see each other uh, live. And uh, you know, afterwards we can uh, join the, uh, our breakout groups or we can go into the foyer to hang out a little bit. I, I understand there are a lot of dogs and babies in the foyer, which isn't a usual occurrence uh, at church. And so glad we can have fun virtually that way. Um, also being on Zoom worship, we, we do need some help. So we're still looking for some discussion leaders or some Zoom hosts, some uh, video editors. If you are interested in serving in this way, please just let your pastors know. We would very much appreciate that. Um, Thanksgiving banquet has not been canceled. We are still having a Thanksgiving banquet. This is one of our big outreach events uh, every year. And this year, we still get to um, do outreach. Uh, it's just a, a little different way. And so if you can get uh, invite some of your neighbors and friends and get them committed, then you can go to our um, RSVP for meals that's shown over here. You can go on the FBC website. You have it as well. You can sign yourself up and sign your friends up. And so when you pick up a Thanksgiving dinner, you can pick everyone's up and just drop it off to your family or friends. Um, it's a great way to um, 
uh, do outreach now. Uh, there's going to be an invitation on the dinner box that's going to be given to you, given to um, you to, to pick up. And it tells um, everybody about the Zoom service that will be there at 7 p.m. You don't have to eat your dinner at 7 p.m. You can eat it fresh when it arrives. Uh, we want to make sure you enjoy your meal together. Okay, two to four o'clock pickup um, at Pastor Steve's house uh, in Foster City or, or my home in South San Francisco. And uh, we're looking forward to that. There is a deadline. Make sure you sign up by uh, November 1st. Okay, thank you. Uh, our, there is a continuation of our theology class on Tuesdays, 7.30 p.m., this Tuesday, Jordan McFarland, our MC today, will be talking about which translation should we use and uh, a very practical application to understanding bibliology. Our awesome adventure for kindergarten to fifth graders continues today, 1230 to 130. We know that it's going to overlap a little bit in the, into our business meeting, um, but right after, we know some par parents can... Uh, be at the business meeting or, um, you know, they, it'll, it'll finish by then so some of our teachers can join as well. We'll just be a little bit late. Um, our Venture Club uh, is continuing during the school year, and our theme is Pioneering the Christian Adventure. It's every other Friday night, and so this Friday, the 23rd, uh, they have a, a lesson. You can contact me for the Adventure Club link. Uh, but we would very much love to have your kids join us for that. Our last teacher training class is is tomorrow. And so uh, we, we've been having a great time together. Our teacher, uh, teacher instructors have been doing a fabulous job. And so um, this is our last one where we're practically going to be trying out uh, teaching online and virtually. Our high school Sunday school class continues uh, every Sunday. It's uh, now moved from 11 to 12 uh, p.m., uh, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., and it's on the Zoom 2 link. And so join us uh, today. Uh, I've been here today, so come join us. Uh, giving Online continues. If you, um, if you would love to give in this way, that is great. You can still send your checks to Fellowship Bible Church church's physical address and it'll be forwarded to a uh, to lawrence to pick up um our business meeting is today also at 1 p.m and so come join us on fbc fpc bc zoom one that the same link as we are on presently um our mission uh, conference was fabulous uh if you want to give to our missionaries the ramirez's or the duns um you can send your check to Fellowship Bible Church, just earmark at the Missions Conference Love Offering. We will make sure that it goes to them in the honorarium. Also, um, if you want to join our beloved Missions Committee, we'd love to have you. And these are our, our, our super members here. Uh, they help keep in touch with all the missionaries. They've put on our Missions Conference. They sponsored our Meals with Missionaries. Uh, they keep us in, informed about the needs of our missionaries. And and if you want to be a part of that, we'd love to have you. A missionary of the week is Kara Caps. Kara um, praised the Lord recently for uh, Rain and Chaco. Uh, she is having some time now to study God's word. Um, there have been more cases of uh, COVID recently, but praise the Lord, she's in an area where uh, there isn't too many cases. Uh, and she has appreciated the messages of encouragement that, that people have sent her recently. And so uh, please keep that up. Let's, uh, let's, um, let's pray. Father, thank you for, for um, our message today. Thank you for God's patience with all of us and for the chances that he gives. And as, as long as we have breath, we have the ability to accept Christ as Savior. As, and Lord, help us to be uh, a witness to others who don't know you. Help us not to give up. And Lord, sometimes we can be discouraged by hardened hearts. And Lord, uh, help us to uh, keep praying. Help us to keep talking. Help us to keep loving others to Christ. 
And so, Lord, uh, we thank you because you're a gracious and a loving God, and you can lead people to repentance. Lord, we also um, want to pray for Kara, just meet all her needs, Lord. Uh, thank you for her ministry in Chaco and for this time that she gets to stay, stay in your word and study and absorb it. And she's been enjoying uh, time uh, uh, spending with you. And so uh, we pray that you meet, continue to meet all her needs. Uh, bless our business meeting today, Lord. Uh, also for our children's uh, uh, class today as well. And everything that is going to be done this week may be all done for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.